Hey everybody, everybody welcome to PhotoCare Rentals. Thank you for joining us tonight. This is the first edition of the new education and networking series here at PhotoCare Rentals, so welcome. Just want to thank everybody for coming, our panelists and our moderator, and a special thanks to Mr. Fred Blake over there who runs, uh, runs the rental department here. And John Kosha, general manager for PhotoCare over there. Both amazing folks, and make sure to say hi after the panel. Um, and let's also thank Fujifilm, our sponsor, for helping make this possible. Our friend at Fujifilm here. So first, we'll have a brief presentation from John from Fujifilm. Hi there, how's it going? Can you hear me? Is it good? So uh, today I'm gonna give you a quick run through uh, Frame.io and our cloud, uh, camera to cloud um, pairing that we have with it. So uh, we have uh, today three cameras that can pair up with Frame.io and you can deliver your media straight to the cloud and you can collaborate with your teams across uh, anywhere really. As long as they have the link, they'll be able to see the clips, they'll be able to see the stills, they can approve of them, deny, comment on them, um, you know, for, for executing your proxy workflow and um, getting your dailies uh, uh, handed over to the right team without having to physically move it over and physically hand it over and download it to a hard drive and then hand that hard drive over to somebody. You can just have Frame.io <coughs> deliver that to the cloud and then you be presented with this information anywhere you can access the internet as long as you have that link. Um, with you. So today, I have two of our bodies that have it. We have an XH2S and a GFX100 the second, which is our newest uh, addition to our lineup. And uh, if you can take a look at that screen there, what I'm gonna do is, it's gonna take a quick photo here. Then you'll see it populate. <coughs> and anyone with that link that I've created should be able to see that, no matter where they are in the world. Um, so you can upload your actual full res files if your bandwidth allows, or you can just download proxy media and um, raw and JPEG uh, stills as well. So yeah, you can uh, come find me after the, the presentation and we can chat more about it. Uh, we also have some pamphlets over on all the st uh, bar stools there. And uh, if you scan that QR code, you'd be able to get more information and uh, check it out, all right? Thanks, John. Let's give it up for John. And so without further ado, let me have the honor of introducing tonight's moderator and award-winning producer, director, and DP, and a local legend, Mr. David Leitner. Thanks, Michael. Um, I'm not gonna spend any, any time on me. Um, we don't, we've got an hour, and we've got three amazing DPs here tonight. I could spend an hour with each one of them. Um, so if you guys would come up, Martina. Uh, Matt and uh, Wolfgang. We're, at, we're actually all DPs, so we'll be swapping uh, comments all evening, I'm sure. Um, I'm going to ask each of you, I, I, I've been around forever. Um, you can tell by the lack of hair, and it's white now. I, I only know that when I look in the mirror every day. You'll all get there, too. Um, I started out in the days of Verite documentary. We were just talking about that a um, long time ago. We're in a different world now, but you guys have all transitioned too, uh, from film through analog and now digital. So tonight we're going to talk about digital, but I just want to point out that all of these guys are, are maybe not Matt so much, but all you guys are, are veterans and have a ton of experience. <laughs> no, don't. <laughs> he's, he's older than he looks. Um, so I'm going to ask you to introduce yourselves. Uh, we'll start on the far end with Wolfgang Held, ASC, his proper name now. <laughs> um, well, I'm Wolfgang Held. I'm a cameraman who shoots a lot of documentaries um, these days, but I used to shoot a lot of indie features. So I started out doing some 20, almost 30 indie features. 
shooting, shooting on film and uh, always shot documentaries, which has been always my first love. And that's mostly what I do now. I still do the occasional narrative film, but I mostly do docs and doc series lately. So that's, we'll talk more about that. And again, your formal name is Wolfgang Hill ASC. So you you're might <laughs> have to explain that. <laughs> yeah, do I have to explain that? Okay, everyone's shaking your heads no. Okay. Um, go ahead, Matt. But you should because if you're American, American Society of Cinematographers, it's, it's quite a distinct honor. Uh, my name is Matt Porwall, um, and I have pretty much only shot documentaries, mostly verite. Um, I've never shot a, f a fiction film, um, although I've, I guess, assisted on some of them. Uh, I kind of came up assisting and was fortunate enough to do a lot of assisting work with Wolfgang uh, back in the day, and now here we are. <laughs> Marti Martina? I just learned something. I didn't know that. <laughs> Um, my name is Martina Radwan. I also started out in fiction as a camera assistant way back in Berlin. And then I shot some indie features, but primarily I'm doing f documentaries for a very long time. Yeah. And tonight we're going to talk about Verite. Um, how many, you, uh, we're in photo care, so I assume that you all know how to handle a still camera, but how many of you are shooting video, too, or digital? That's about half of you. Well, you've <laughs> probably every camera you're own, you own can do both, which is really the point of this evening. That doesn't make you a filmmaker, it doesn't make you a director of photography, but it gives you the ability to shoot the digital video that we've all been shooting. And even the smallest camera now, can shoot remarkable 4K video, it, e even the cell phone, we, uh, iPhone or whatever we have in our pockets. So you can argue that everyone is, uh, I'm going to use the old term cinematographer, everyone's a cinematographer now. Um, this panel is about verite, and if you don't have a background in film history, you may not be connected to the early documentaries made in the early 1960s. Uh, Verite distinguished itself because before Verite, uh, cameras were large and heavy and sound uh, wasn't battery powered and you couldn't sync it up either. Look at documentaries from the 50s and you always see that it's post-synced. Well, the early 60s brought synchronization technology, eventually uh, using little crystals that were originally taken out of bullet watches, and that's another historical thing you can go look up. But they, they vibrated at a certain frequency, and they would vibrate in the camera, and they'd vi vi vibrate in the Nagra recorder, and thereby the two of them could be later sunk up because those vibrations were very, very, very precise. So we all came, Matt, you may be the exception, but we all came <laughs> along during a time when people were still shooting film and they were shooting what was called double system because on film you couldn't record sound. So you had to have a separate sound recorder. Uh, all of that has changed now. If you choose to record audio, you can do it on the still cameras you're using. Everybody knows that. <coughs> Verite filmmaking is, is so-called fly-on-the-wall filmmaking. It's where you don't insert yourself into the picture as the camera person. You hang back. <coughs> Maybe you use a longer lens. Or there's another variant where you use a wide-angle lens and you come close to the people you're filming, which acknowledges that you're in the same space but you try not to interfere with what's going on before the camera. So that's what we're going to discuss tonight. And each of my guests has a sample uh, that they've brought to show you what their work, their latest work looks like. And so let's start with Wolfgang. Do you want to show your sample? Sure. I mean, in terms of Verite, um, I chose, we were asked to show something that's recent. So that was hard because during the pandemic, there was very little Verite. But I did a film about three years ago. It was shot in the mountains in Ecuador. Um, and it's a film about a group of uh, rebels that um, was trying to fight a Chinese mine um, with uh, it's basically an underground cell that was called terrorists by the, um, by the government, the Ecuadorian government. And we sort of, a German filmmaker and I infiltrated that cell uh, and we filmed with one of their leaders who you see in the, in the red head. Um, and this is the first day of filming and uh, yeah, anyway, let's put sound up too.
Es la catedral. Camisa. Cómo viene la policía, miren toda la policía que está llegando. O sea, bájate con las cámaras porque eso se partió. Yo soy prensa, yo soy fiscal. Aquí está toda la gente de las documentales de derechos humanos. Aquí están todos los de derechos humanos. A ver, están todos los de derechos humanos en los carros. Oye, yo soy el consejo de defensor del pueblo. ¿Qué les pasa? Señor fiscal, ¿qué les pasa? No, no, no. Sí, Carlos Andrés Vera, ¿qué les pasa? No, no, no. ¿Qué les pasa? ¿Qué les pasa, policía? Oye, no me golpees. Oye, no. Yo soy de la Defensoría del Pueblo. Señor, yo soy del Consejo de la Defensoría del Pueblo. Me está quitando mi teléfono. Vea, ¿qué pasa, señor? ¡Ya! ¿Qué pasa? Thank you. Um, just a couple of things about the clip that um, I wanted to mention. The, the reason that I, I chose those clips, it chose like such a, uh, there's three scenes and a lot of them are the more quiet scenes where we're alone with the rebel as he's getting ready before one of the many conflicts. And then when he's taking a break, um, going to one of the lakes, they're fighting over the water actually, it's getting polluted by the mine, so the, the, the lakes are important because that's what the indigenous people are fighting over. Um, so um, I wanted to show the variety between exactly what a lot of people are talking about, whether we shoot with a zoom lens, it's very rough, it's handheld, it's in the moment, there's something happening and you have to be sort of, you know, alert and, and able to film it, but you're also in situations that are also sometimes um, not always calm and you're trying to find cinematic moments like the early on, the, the first and the second scene feel much more cinematic, I shoot with a prime lens. Um, and to blend the two is sort of my, my always the struggle in all the films I'm doing. So I, I wanted to choose sort of a range of these types of uh, scenes from this from this film mm -hmm. to show both ends of the spectrum. When that fight was taking place outside on the street, or when they were trying to arrest that guy, um, yeah, were, that were guy you is the same guy you see in the. Old yeah. that were you filming surreptitiously? Did they know you were filming? Yeah, no, no, we, well. The guy, the, the rebel leaders we were embedded with, he knew, and the driver knew, but he was but, freaking but out and the, but driving back. But the authorities back. didn't no, know. No, but we couldn't get arrested. That's why we were hiding the camera, and I stayed in the car and didn't run out. But then we actually drove the car back and ran out, and the scene continues, and then, you know, the, we, we shot some of it with the iPhone, then the camera came up, and we filmed the rebel side of the conflict where they're throwing down burning tires, and... 
Um, and they're getting the guy who was arrested, they get the old women come down and they get him back out, which is kind of amazing. They negotiate him his release, and so at, late at night you see him sitting in the rebel camp and they're getting the guns ready to, to drive up to the mine. They actually did take over the mine to this day. They've held it, they burned it down. The mine is still uh, un uncharted territory <laughs> for the government and on indigenous land, and it's, uh, they burned the whole thing down. So you'll film with whatever camera you have at hand if a scene develops in front of you that needs to get filmed. You mentioned iPhone. You'll grab something if you need to. Well, I didn't shoot with the iPhone, but yes, I mean, that's just the beauty of when, when something's happening, you have to be there, at the, and sometimes the iPhone is the best thing you have, because you always have it with you. So if a scene is happening and it's arresting, it doesn't matter how it looks. So I mean, that's what, you, what I always feel with documentary, that... But then when you have time, you want to do some, you know, trying to get cinema going, and, and that's this com constant back and forth. Um, I didn't shoot the iPhones, but I did know going into the conflicts, as we're driving up to, you know, we knew that the, that the police was trying to take over the, um, you know, to get the rebels out who had made a roadblock, and we knew there was going to be conflict, so the director asked me to put on a zoom lens, which I haven't done in a long time, and it's always um, a bit hard for me to, to work on that. Um, because that, that used to be the staple of documentary filmmaking, where you zoom in and out, you have the white shot, and then you can punch in. Um, and I always thought that was lazy, because you know, if I know somebody, I'm filming somebody, if I want to get a close-up, I'll walk up close to him, like I did in the opening shot. I go right up his arm to his face. I'm this close, he, the guy knows me, and I feel like you know, I've spent time with him, and I have permission to do it, and the camera shows it. But the zoom lens you know, lets me film him through the window, you know, where he gets arrested. The, 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 that would have been too small with a, the with a prime lens. So there's this constant battle in my mind, what's better for Verite. You know, they both have the reasons to be made. And you're pulling your own focus. Yeah, I mean, this whole shoot was me, a sound man, and the director, three of us. The drone was in our backpack. There's a drone shot in there in the end. I mean, that's, you know, uh, and we had to fix up. Andrew, who was actually amazing, he helped with it. So it was four of us. Um, on, on the road, so it's still a crew, but it's not like a large crew. Sound man uses a boom sound person. Yeah, or wire. Some he was wired. That's why you hear about. Yeah, the sound man was hiding <laughs> in the back of the car in that scene. Do you record audio yourself as well as a backup? There's an onboard mic that I keep on that is high end because if you're close to people, it gets good sound. But yeah, and I like to listen when I film, so I always have a hop to the sound person, which means that the sound person sends you the sound that they're recording into the camera so I can listen with the headphones from the camera so if I'm far away from people I know what they're saying. I know, oh is this interesting, is something about to go down? So I know, you know, to go close or to, to film it and to, or turn on the camera. So it's important to always listen so you have the headphones in when you shoot these kind of things a lot. The scenes, a few of those scenes were beautifully edited. Um, wh what's the status of the film now? The film never came out here. It, it played in the cinemas in Germany, um, and it's done pretty well in the festival circuit, but um, nobody's picked it up in this country because it's in Spanish, made by a German director, like so many great projects that just don't always travel around the world. You know, We see sort of a small slice of good films in the world in America, and we think we see it all, but we certainly don't. It's profoundly true. Uh, Matt, um, no, no, I'm going to save you for last, the best for last. <laughs> um, Martina, would you go next and show your... Clip. So Mike asked uh, for clips, and I'm in post-production right now on my own film that I directed and partially shot, and so I prepared the clips, and then I realized I didn't even shoot this. So. How was your day, Ah, oh, it's very busy. Hey. Yeah. Cheers. Yeah. Yeah, you guys have to get used to the idea of <laughs> bank. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Yes, <laughs> I'm You guys have to get used to the idea of bank account going there regularly, checking it in, checking your numbers. Okay. You need to know your numbers. Do you know or do you understand why it's good to, to read and write and learn numbers? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yes. Good. 
That was the next step I wanted to talk about. What happened to NASA? She grew up. I'm very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> of course. What kind of job do you want? Obviously, it's a personal film. I'm in it, but I chose that um, scene because it's something mundane that we're all dealing with in documentaries all the time. The kitchen table scene, right, where you're like, okay, you have people talking, and in particular because we also didn't speak the language, and so I was directing the scene, and the way it works is literally like you ha you think you know what the scene is about, and in this case, I knew what the scene was about because I was leading it. But then it's also the conversation between the DP and the director, like, how do you shoot that, right? And because so much verite is, you look at a verite scene and it's so much about editing. But what I really like about this is like, she had such a, she being Ju Julia, Julia Dengel, uh, she had such a great feeling on like, when to, to pan, like when to follow. And, and she also didn't understand Mongolian. And that, I really love that about the scene. There's such a beautiful rhythm to, when do you stay on the person? When do you have to edit? And then when can you connect the shots, right? So it becomes a more lived-in scene. And then the second scene I did shoot, uh, and that was, I had the idea of, like he told me that he would run up that, that hill to the monument, and I thought like, oh, I'm gonna give him the Rocky moments because you know he's, he's succeeding and this and then the other. And then we landed up there, and he was so uncomfortable because part of his history is to be an outsider, to be dismissed, to, uh, you know, the way he grew up, is very, there's a big stigma on it. And, and so he was up there feeling so uncomfortable and feeling disconnected and I had to pivot. Like I had to, I'm like, okay, this is not a rocky moment, so how do I tell that story, right? And the other reason why I chose that is also to talk about so-called B-roll, which I don't believe in. I think everything is A-roll. Everything, everything has to serve the character building. Totally correct. I completely agree. I've been saying that for years. I hate that <laughs> term. Don't right. ever, everyone knows not to say B-roll around me. Don't well, let I mean me interrupt. I, have, I have been in so many films w where you shoot in like some small town somewhere and you know the director or producer, they drive you to Main Street and open the door and say like, shoot some B-roll and you're like, but what? Like, <laughs> like, how is this connected to the story we're telling? So, those were my thoughts about the scenes. Uh, don't you don't ask me for beauty shots either. Right. <laughs> um, well, hopefully they are beautiful, but beauty is also in the eye of the beholder. Meaning that every shot you take is, is equally as important, right. and you're investing as much of yourself in it as yeah. every other shot. Um, that table scene. Mm, if you haven't shot a table scene, you might presume that you need two camera people, or maybe three, because that's how it's done sometimes. But that was shot with one camera person, which is how most of us do it most of the time. And you have to work out strategies to do that. You have to pre-think, maybe arrange people around the table. There's an issue with lighting. You know, if someone might be backlit, what do you do about that, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have to worry about sound issues, and so forth and so on. 
Um, can you give us a little of the backstory to your film? Tell us a little bit more about it. Well, I was hired to shoot a film about child homelessness in Mongolia, and I met the the boy who ran up to the Russian mountain, uh, to the Russian monument, and uh, I fell in love and decided to help him because nobody wanted to, and I, I was at a point in my career where I'm like, what are we actually doing? Like, we're traveling the world, and we're telling all these stories, but the people who are in the film, do they really, uh, you know, do they really... What's the word? I'm brain agency, have agency. Well, no, but do they get something out of it, right? Because we're asking people to participate for the greater good, but do they get something out of it? And this was a 16-year-old boy who was homeless. I mean, so, and nobody wanted to do anything, and so it was like, I'll do something very naive, very whatever. That's part of the film. Uh, and then I helped them find a foster family, and that turned sour. And so I always wanted to tell a story about them, and then I realized I can't tell a story about them if I don't do what I asked them to do, be on camera, plus I changed their life. So it became three kids, long story, but it became three kids. And so <coughs> basically I am the main character because I'm the only one I can talk for. I can't talk for the kids. It's like I can just show how they react to. So it's a very personal film. And it's going to be premiered shortly? It's I can't talk about it yet, but it's going to premiere in New York City in the fall, so you can all do the math. <laughs> <laughs> can you? And the title is Tomorrow, Tomorrow, Tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> Matt, would you like to show your clip? Yes. Um, so this is. Uh, this is a film called Once Upon a Time in Uganda that was a labor of love for everybody involved in making the film. Um, it's funny thinking about showing a, a recent clip from something. We started shooting this film in 2015, but it just had maybe a month and a half ago its theatrical premiere, so I guess technically it's new. Um, but this is a, a film about um, a group of filmmakers in... Uganda and Kampala that make incredibly low budget action kung fu films for like 200 bucks a pop. Oh, hang on. <laughs> Sorry, just to give a little bit more context. Um, hey, hey Matt, who's the director of this? Uh, the director is Catherine Zubek. Oh. Um, but it's one of those, you know, it, the reason that I really wanted to make this film is that, or work on this film, um, is that you know, we all tend to get, in documentary world, you end up doing a lot of dark, depressing things that, you know, at the end of the day, really, you know, you need some quiet time. Uh, and this is a film that just embraces the love of filmmaking. And it was one of those films that, you know, it you can make a film with absolutely nothing and people all over the world will love it if it's a fun story and a good story. And so it was just really special to go back to that of kind of the, the reason that I feel like we all got into this in the first place. What Hollywood runs on banana leaves. <laughs> this is the, the costumes. We are preparing for shooting late at night uh, for the, our upcoming movie. It's in a live in Uganda. So everyone is busy here. That's what I like with the film industry, because everything you're doing is fun. Everything is fun. When you're enjoying, you do your work while you're enjoying. That's what I do. You see? That's why he's going to be eating. That's why he's going to be eating. It's uncanny. It's mm. <laughs> It's my stunt Let me top. see the skin. Kind of. It's, I'm telling you, we're yeah. the brothers of another mother. Yes. It's, it's frightening. From today, I baptize you. Has <laughs> Mzungu. <laughs> okay, now we start the fight. Or what? Jackie! <laughs> Cut! 
cut, cut, cut. Mzungu, nyingi rao. Mzungu. Rio mzungu. Rio mzungu, kami sayo. Oh, eh, eh. Mzungu. This is a story about cannibals and Chuck Norris. I have many nicknames here, you know, Jesus for one, but another one is Chuck Norris. I somehow think I look like Chuck Norris. <laughs> this is the Wakaliwood Cannibal Village. So what you're going to see happen is might be five or six of them carrying me in and uh, putting me on this table we just built. And they're going to cut off my leg, eat that first. I grab it from them. I beat the hell out of them. Um, and then they proceed to rip my guts open, which are being prepared at the moment. There's actually, um, there's a goat being slaughtered and the head cut off and gutted right now. And they're shaving it to make it look pink like I am. You gotta do it quickly because they want to eat it. I think this looks like Alan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, this is Alan. <laughs> it will work. It, it will work. Will. Yeah, it will work. Yeah, yeah with the intestines. Inside. You have oh, to keep inside. them, keep them, yeah. Alan makes a, uh, you know, good sound when he's dying. He's, <laughs> So we like him. We like Alan dying, you know, with that sound. Tonight we don't kill Alan. Yeah, did you mention the name of the film? Uh, Once Upon a Time in Uganda. Oh, that's right. I'm yeah. sorry. Um, are you, in the verite footage, are you recording your own sound? Are you um, a one-man band? So it all depends. Um, in, in this, I would say, I mean, this was all one night, so this we did have a sound recordist for. Um, but I would say probably half the time we would, I'd be doing my own sound. Um, and a lot of other, I mean, there's been other films and series where we've, we haven't had a sound recordist at all. So I think it's, you know, I mean, it's, it's a place and time. I always like to tell people when it comes to if you're asked to record your own sound or to do your own sound, there better be a really good reason for it because the picture will suffer, the sound will suffer, which is by far more important than picture. Um, but if it means that it keeps your footprint low, it gets you better access, there's sensitivity issues, things like that, then, you know, then it makes sense. Um, but you also have to con kind of control because it can get out of control pretty quickly. So. I noticed there were moments where people uh, stood and spoke to the camera and told the camera what they were doing, f kind of like an interview where you have someone talk to the camera. That's one style of documentary making. You can make a, docu a verite documentary with none of that, and the purists do that. They don't have anybody standing up and talking to the camera. There are no talking heads, and most importantly, there's no narration. Verite films have no narration. I just watched a four-hour film on two restaurants in the middle of France made by Fred Wiseman, which is up at the New York Film Festival. Would you believe any, an audience can sit for four hours and watch people cooking in a kitchen? But they can. How is it, wh what's, what's so interesting? You'll, you'll have to go and find out for yourselves. But that's verite filmmaking. Well, something I will say about that, though, that's funny, is that when it goes back to relationship with your subjects, um, you know, your approach, because I think, you know, I think, in, at least in my view, cinema verite doesn't exclusively mean objectivity and fly on the wall. It means if you, if you are there and your presence will change the situation no matter how much you, you 
decide that it's not going to. There's no way that by having people that they haven't met with a camera show up to your house that you're not gonna alter the way that you do something. Um, but it's about respecting your presence Embracing your presence if it does start to change the situation then you don't shy away from it I mean you look at the Maisels are you know in a, a perfect example of that if in Grey Gardens They are a character in that film because they couldn't not be um, And that's not a bad thing. And so what's funny about some of the interviews That are in that scene uh, Harriet who's talking about you know, we just it's such a great time and I love filmmaking. That's Isaac Nabwana the the director's wife um, we didn't set up an interview. We have a relationship with everybody. We had spent six years shooting this film. Harriet just came up and started talking to me. And so it wasn't an interview. It was actually part of the scene. And then, you know, Alan comes up and bumps her and then the scene deviates from there. And so that was actually just a, a real moment as opposed to an interview. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a, it's a game that we play of, you know, what is our relationship with the subjects and how do we best get the truest version of themselves even if it's not true because, you know, our presence is there. How many in the audience have been filmed before in front of a camera? Oh, oh my God. <laughs> well then, you, I hope you agree with me. It's a weird thing to be looking at this glass eye and you have a light on you sometimes you can't see because it, it flares you out. It's weird to be in front of a camera. And so there is, it's one of the deepest topics in shooting Verite films, the presence of you and the camera and the crew, if you've got a larger crew. Some people shrink their crews down to two people or e even one person because of that issue, the issue of you know, how intimate the, situ the filming situation is. I mean, I have to say, I, I broke all the rules you just mentioned because I have interviews because that was the only way of getting the kids to talk by themselves. Like they're, you know, they're not used to talk about themselves. Nobody ever asked them how they are, what they want, blah, blah, blah. So you really had to get it out of them. And in order to give them a voice in the film, I needed to interview them. Like, and so that was one. And then what was the other thing? Oh, narration. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing my own narration. So I'm breaking all the rules. But I have a, you know, the entire film is a very tough film. So. Rules are meant to be broken. <laughs> yeah, that's what Bailey Wilder said. In filmmaking, there are no rules. Well, and I think something that is, you know, there's, there's always the thought of, you know, if I reduce my crew size, if I shoot with a smaller camera, if I do this or if I do that, from kind of a logistical standpoint, that my access will go up. And that's just not true. Um, I think it all comes down to, you know, what is the relationship that you have with your subjects? You know, people always ask, oh, well, if you, know, if you have this massive camera on your shoulder, doesn't that make your presence more known? And I said, well, if I, if I was not a nice person, then it would. But it's still me behind the camera, whether it's a big camera or a small camera. But someone with a really tiny camera who is not respecting the situation, not you know, kind of being in the moment, is going to be much more of a, a, an obstacle in that scene regardless of the size of the camera. And the same thing applies for crew size. Mm -hmm. I think shrinking your crew size is easier because you can't necessarily control how everybody in that crew would have the same sentiment that you do. Um, but those are important considerations, I think, when you're making a Verite film. I also want to push back a little bit too. I think the times have changed. So when you're talking about Verite, you're talking about Verite at a time when not everybody had a cell phone. Everybody was always filming themselves. People weren't doing Instagram. Um, the biggest problem I face, even in this film, is that people perform for the camera too much. And, and how do you get to true emotions in it? I think that's where I feel like that's almost a harder battle right now because especially with younger kids, they just like want to sort of perform this character they've seen on some reality show or some other documentary series and they think they're in a movie of their life, and it's very hard to get to some deeper truth because people are so used to being filmed, being on images, and, and in this case with Raul, there was, you know, what was helpful is that there were some real moments of conflict where you don't have time to figure out how you look or what happens, but there's other times when they're sitting at the campfire at night, I don't know, they, they, he knew I was filming, and. Uh, 
he's also acting the Che Guevara type that he wants to be, you know? I mean, I it's true. I mean, it's, it's how much do you get to a deeper truth? And I think it's about the relationship. That's the one thing that hasn't changed. I think it's w what are we, what's our relationship to the people? How much time do we spend? How much, you know, how much investment we're doing? And Martina has certainly done a lot of time investment in that film. Um, so that's what I, I find most scintillating about documentaries. Well, but I think it's, it's the relationship, but also the time. And I think one of the things that we're all battling right now is that we don't get enough time anymore for a documentary that is a ver very tape film. I mean, so it's, it's easily now like, go shoot that. And then in four weeks, we come back and shoot something else. And then let's just quickly an interview because you can actually, you can't get it in a day. I mean, you, ha you need the time so that the, the, the characters or the subject or whatever you want to call them, participants are familiar with you and they really forget about you. I mean, nobody ever forgets about the camera. That's also why fly on the wall. We were never fly on the wall. I mean, we're in the room with the people. And then, you know, what Wolfgang said, if you know them well enough, you can actually really participate. And that, to me, is a very big decision in terms of like creative decision. Like, am I participating or am I hanging back and looking at them? Right? And, and you can't, when you have like two shoot days, you can't even make that decision because you're just catching up. But if to me, like true verite is when you get ahead of it, right? When you when you hang with the, with whatever the story is, with wh whoever the characters are, and you get them to know so well that you can actually anticipate what's going to happen, because that's how you get around the kitchen table in time when it then looks like it's four cameras or three cameras, because you know them enough, right? To anticipate, like you look at their face and you're like, mm, I think he's going to do this and that, and then you position yourself to catch that. Another thing I've noticed, because Wolfgang, you were saying that so many um, people are used to being filmed now. Once upon a time, the only people who looked directly into the camera were newscasters who were reading the evening news. Today, when you put a camera on someone, you may, you may have an interviewer on the side of you who's asking the questions, and you may instruct the interviewee to respond to the interviewer. Don't look in the camera. Speak to the interviewer. I guarantee you, a minute later, they turn to the camera and start speaking into the camera. And in, in the grammar of filmmaking, if you look directly down the lens, that's a very different thing than looking off to the side. It's hard to control that now because that's what people think you're supposed to do. And everyone sits in front of their computer and does Zoom sessions now. Yeah. But well, why but do we have to control it if that's what they want to do? I, I think we should just be much more loose with the grammar. I mean, if they want to look in a camera, let's let, let, let them do it, you know? Well, again, that goes back to like, we all know there's a camera in the room. Yeah. I mean, people have become so sophisticated, audience has become so sophisticated, you can't pretend anymore that there was no camera. I mean, you can't pretend like we weren't there. And so I think we also we all have to thank uh, Alice Gibney for looking into the camera because right? he made it a thing. That's Errol Morris. Errol Morris, Errol Morris I think. Sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> and, and how did Errol Morris do it? Do you oh, it's well, he does it very, very complicated. Explain his device. So the Errol Morris for his Interatron straight down the lens uh, interviews that would be very, very long and and would have a teleprompter on the ACAM that would be feeding into another room a separate camera also with a teleprompter and the camera that's shooting the interview would be fed, the teleprompter would be seeing Errol Morris's face who's sitting in a whole other room talking into his own camera and they would basically be doing a very complicated Zoom call um, so that you can then film the, the direct eye line. And what's Funny is, I mean, th there's a play. You know, now it's gotten a little bit easier where you can do it with just a, you know, a mirror at 45 degree angle, and you can sit next to the next to the camera, and you still end up flagging the director off and all this. Um, you know, I think it depends on the director, but when I've done a lot of work with Matthew Heineman on Cartel Land and the Trade and various others, and all of his interviews are straight down the barrel, and we literally just sit at the camera and ask the subject to look down the barrel of the lens, and they do it. And it's fine. And if they don't, then I can kind of tap the bottom of the lens and, and bring their eye line back. But, you know, it's, I think, again, that's where so much of this just comes down to relationship and trust and just being a part of the environment that, you know, if there's a, a directorial decision that you have and you want to direct somebody, which, you know, we generally don't 
do, I think in an interview is kind of a slightly different situation, but like it's an ask that you can make if you have a connection. But if you just kind of show up and don't have it, then you know people don't necessarily want to do it. You need contraptions to convince them. Yeah, Errol's kind of a comical character, and he wants you to see his face when, you, when you're talking, when you're looking down the barrel of the lens. That's why he went to all the trouble, because he, ev he, he uh, elicits something different from people if they can see his face. Yeah, and I think, I think that's a, you know, I mean, there's, there's definitely a disadvantage to asking someone to tell a very emotional story to just a lens. Um, but there's also something that the longer that that interview goes on, then people just get into their own head and stop thinking that they're talking to a person who's looking for a certain answer, or they start to model their answer to, to fit what that person wants to hear, is you just kind of go into your own head and you know your eye line might drift off for a while and you're thinking, and then you come back and you're just talking to yourself. But then you can also, if you see that person, it can be nice, because then you can kind of urge them along and. Mm -hmm in those pauses at the end of a statement, you can just sit and not answer and they see the look on your face that I'm not gonna jump in and ask the next question. Then they fill, the, fill that void with an even better response than you would have gotten otherwise. So there's, you know, I mean, it, there's pros and cons to both of them for sure. Yeah, y you know, this, uh, Verite films, um, this, is, this always goes unsaid, but we're always thinking about hour and hour and a half films, but we're living in a TikTok age does Verite even exist anymore? Or a, or a multi-part series age. It's one or the other. Right. I feel like I haven't done a feature film in a while. It's either it's doing like five, six episodes that probably should be a feature um, or features that should be episodic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even sure the term Verite even is a current anymore. That's what I'm getting at. It may be a term from the past at this point. I mean, oh. funny enough, you know, you would think nobody shoots a film in America looking at our three <laughs> clips. But when you look at foreign films, they're doing verite. I think we just got stuck for a moment, hopefully just a moment, in this serious interview reenactment world of the streamers. Well, and I think COVID changed a lot of that too. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's we weren't able to go into people's homes. We weren't able to spend 24-7. We weren't able to mm. do that, um, you know, with exceptions. I mean, I did a film with Heinemann uh, called The First Wave, where we documented the first wave of COVID in New York, and so that was pure verite. Um, you know, not necessarily, it's faint for heart, and I think there were plenty of other films that I was doing at the same time where the production companies would literally have to ask legal if we could shoot B-roll, your favorite word, which it, and that term it 100% was, but of just people walking down the street because we had to know are we at least six feet from a restaurant? Are we this? Are we that? And then, you know, the next week we're now going and kind of going into the ER, going into various places. And so it's, it's still around. I think it's just harder to fund and harder to kind of bring ourselves back from, from COVID. Mm. Yeah, I have a quick question about what you do when you're not filming, because we see obviously the end result, but I'm curious what you do in Verite when you're not filming. Like, are you paying attention to what's, I know Wolfgang, you said you try to listen to what's happening, but anything else, or even when you have some downtime? Well, what is the downtime? You know, who defines that, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like it's, it's constant. Um, you're always looking, you're always listening, you're always waiting. And I think, you know, going back to even, you know, kind of people being performative for camera, there's been, I mean, I'm trying to think in, when we shot film Cartel and we shot over a thousand hours of footage for that for an hour and a half movie. And I don't think that anything we shot within the first month or more made the film in terms of a scene. But there's, you know, we're sleeping in the desert. We're going on these long hikes of people who are patrolling the border. We're doing all this stuff. Well, you know, there's always a, a place. That's us kind of starting to saturate into the world and understand how it works and what it looks like at various times of the day and kind of understanding the mental mindset of people. So that's where there's moments that as you start to understand it, it doesn't, it's not B-roll anymore. It's, it's, it, it's an expression of, what it feels like to be there. And so there's, you know, there's plenty of 
moments that if you're just sitting and waiting and looking for something to happen from like a scene content standpoint, you might be missing a whole bunch of beauty that's going on around you that would equally explain what's happening without anybody talking. So you're always just looking and being aware. I don't think there's really, there's not downtime per se, you know. Um, Matt, you make a good point on another level. When you start a shoot, not one of these shoots that's like one day a week or one day a month, but a consistent shoot for a period of time, you're getting back in the saddle. You, you have saddle sores in the beginning. It takes a while to get into the rhythm of that particular shoot, working with that particular group of people and that subject. That's what I find. The first, the ver first shooting I do is not necessarily, as you just pointed out, not necessarily the best, but I, you, you get into it. Yeah, well, I mean, there's, there was a, a project that will go unnamed that I worked on that, you know, was, it, to me, it felt like reality TV, but it definitely wasn't. It was, it was a docu-series, um, but it was, we were going away for four days to, and I said, okay, well, you know, what have you shot so far, and how does this fit into the story? They're like, no, those four days are a 30-minute episode. I'm like, so what happens if nothing happens, which happens all the time? And it's like, well, then we'll just kind of start to make things happen. I'm like, okay, so now it's, it's not a documentary. Whereas you go and you might spend two months and literally nothing happens, except that you've now spent two months effectively living with the people that you're gonna spend the next year and a half or two years with. You've now established a relationship, you have a bond, You've gotten them over the performative nature because they've had two months of shooting nonsense to get over that, and now it's like, oh, God, you guys are back again. <laughs> like, I'll just get back to my life. And those are all equally important things that are hard from a budgetary standpoint, but from a, you know, kind of creative process of breaking it down to just us being a part of the scene are vitally important. As an extreme example, uh, friends of mine, Jeff Krinus and Joel DeMott, did a classic documentary called Seventeen about kids in high school in oh, Muncie, Indiana. One of my Indiana. favorite movies. It, well, they spent a year living in Muncie before they started shooting. So I just have to say one thing about that film, because we have this endless discussion, Zoom versus Prime films. That's a film I saw in film school that made me want to shoot in Prime. The whole film was shot on a 60 millimeter Prime and, and film. A 10 millimeter Switar. Yeah, 10 millimeter Switar. That's why. Well, there, I mean, there, there are also a bunch, I don't know if anybody knows um, Truffle Hunter. So that's a film that there were, I just happened to be at a Q&A. Th that's a film where just, they were there, but they weren't shooting all the time. And then they were there looking what's happening, and then the next day they set up the camera hoping that the guy goes from left to right, exactly like how they envisioned it, and if it didn't work, well, they did it again. But it was just, that was, they were getting into this knowing how they wanted to shoot this. They wanted to these tableaus, right? And yet, it's a very tape film. Or there's also Tina Long Longhiotti, I can never pronounce her name. She's Italian name, British filmmaker. She did a film about a prostitute and she inserted herself um, with them for, I think, six months and she shot a total of 25 hours. So she was just there all the time with her camera in her lap. And when something, she was also directing, so that makes it easier. But if something happened that she thought was worthy or that she wanted to include in the film, she would shoot. Otherwise, she would just sit there with the camera in her lap. So there are very various ways of doing this and getting very tay and being present all the time, but not necessarily rolling or recording all the time. You say rolling, which of course dates back to 16 millimeter film r going through the camera. And back then it was like a taxi meter running because you had to pay hundreds of dollars to buy the roll of film, you had to pay hundreds of dollars to process, and then you had to pay hundreds of dollars to print or transfer it on a telecine. Today you can shoot for free. It doesn't cost you anything. You just buy a fast enough card, stick it in your camera, and you're off to the races. You guys have a huge advantage. And you have 12 minutes <laughs> or 22 <laughs> minutes, depending on your Mac. <laughs> well. But that's also why you, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to talk about the good old golden times. But if you if you shoot something that's very expensive, you think first and then you press record. Which, what? Amen. which taught a which taught a kind of discipline because if it cost you a lot of money to press the on button on the camera, you were going to think twice or three times before you shot something. Well, you also the think editors about would think you. what you shoot, right? <laughs> 
Right. You think about what you shoot. You're not just like, oh, I'm going to record it and somebody else will figure out how this is going to fit into the story. But it's this fine line, you know, we, w I of we often work for hire with other directors, right? So I find the more experienced the directors are, the more of the vision becomes clearer quicker. In the beginning, you shoot a lot, but then there's some directors who say, okay, just hang back and just see what's happening, just listen in. And they know when stuff's happening that is good for the film because they already have that focus. But it, it's very hard to, for me, to judge that sometimes you miss stuff because you don't, you know, you, if you shoot everything, then you just have a huge editing job. In the film days, I remember we went over 100 hours for a 90 minute film. Um, and that was the most ever. And now, now these feature films, they're over 1,000 hours. Like every Heinemann film is over 1,000 hours for a one and a half hour film of footage. So that's somebody looking through that, transcribing everything everybody says, looking at you know all that footage, and then having like a team of editors whittling it down, and then finding the story in the whittled down footage. It's a huge undertaking, which is why these films become rarer and rarer because we film everything and we have this mountain of the real world captured that we still have to make a film out of. Although it's funny, I've ended up making a lot more work for myself in those kind of projects where I will do my own camera reports specifically so that I can highlight moments in the bulk of everything that happened of please don't miss this this was really yeah. important because i at least remember it at the end of the day where once it the, you know the drive is shipped back and the assistant editor scrubs at three times the speed to look for something and it's like oh god this we we just spent three weeks looking for this one moment please don't lose it <laughs> that's an important point and a lot of times they just miss the great moments entirely I mean, how do you, it's like, it's, it can be impossible to look through, I mean, it's not, because they do it, but a thousand plus hours of footage to whittle down to an hour and a half, I mean, it seems, that's why I'm not an editor, but, you know, it's like. But what about the directors when they say, you shot that, but I never saw that? All the time. Because they never looked at all the footage. Yeah, I mean, we are the ones that are closest to it, and so I sadly take it upon myself to do that at the end of a 16 hour day, but it's important. Hi, yes, um, I wanted to ask, because of how Wolfgang, you said you were embedded with the uh, um, the folks down in Ecuador, it reminded me of when, you know, there are journalists embedded in war-torn countries, Yemen or something like that, and they s have a sort of political immunity in a sense, like it's a war crime to kill a journalist. Um, and you were talking about how you can't get arrested. We, oh, we can't let the cops see a shooting, we might get arrested. And you're saying that you were working on, on cartel land and stuff, and, and it reminded me, like, what do you find is the distinction between what you do and journalism, or is the distinction arbitrary in a way? I mean, I, I would say that to me, you know, and I, I'm not, I didn't go to journalism school, but to me, journalism, for the most part, um, and it depends on the outlet and depends on a lot of things, but is, is a pretty kind of hyper-focused story um, and is very kind of facts-driven and, and delivering that with a little kind of touch of humanity to be able to digest it, where I feel like Verite filmmaking is all about the humanity and the truth kind of evolves over time and is a different truth for the audience of who's looking at it and it's it's a creative endeavor and it's a it's an artistic expression of that moment so that to me that's the difference but the approach is oftentimes very much the same i would say it's character versus issue i don't think journalists are immune to being taken out in fact if you have a camera you have a target on yourself in many places in the world now it's always been bad, but it's never been as bad as it is now. Well, I think there's a lot of overlap, and I think I mean, the New York Times is making amazing films with people that are still photographers that now shoot videos, and some of them now are like you know coming up on the short list for the Oscars. And I think uh, it's just where you gravitate your story to. I think it's just the journalist used to be maybe more story-driven, but I see so many character-driven pieces made by what would be journalists. So I think that's all blurring. I mean, journalists watch movies, too. They watch documentaries. Yeah, and cameramen read newspapers. <laughs> 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 We're all influenced by each other, no?
Yeah, I just wanted to ask quickly about um, your level of control. So Wolfgang, in your film, you had that man walking up the mountain, and it. I think you had three different shots of him walking. There was like a close up. There was a drone. So I'm just kind of wondering. You know, you're all directors of photography, right? So how much of that photography do you actually direct, and how much of it are you just uh, purely a, a fly on the wall? Well, well, like we said, we never really fly on the wall, but I think it comes down to time. So this director was very into the cinema, obviously. So we had time to hold shots long, and we had time to, whenever we had quieter moments, to, it's not a reenactment. I mean, he, we knew he was going to go to the water, but it was happening when we were there with a the camera. Maybe he wouldn't have done it the following day. So it was true to something he does every day, because that's his spiritual sort of renewal lake, he told us. But then when we were shooting it, we had to go fast, I would say, but we did slow him down. So we literally walked with him, and I said, let's go over here, and can you hold him? With one him can, can he does it again, because we did it with a drone? So the whole thing happened like in, you know, maybe 20 minutes, this lake scene. So it was quick, but it wasn't like in three minutes that would have taken him to go down there, sit by the water. I don't know how, how long he wanted to sit there, but then he sat there for like 10 minutes, but that's, and then I did more shots than I never in the film. But that's when I had a lot of time to shoot reflections and this and that, but that took too long. But the walking up, it's, it's directed, but it's, I think it's directed in the truth of a moment, you know? I mean, the opening scene, I, I feel is a better example for that actually, because it's like in the mountains. Um, I did the wide shot from a tripod where you see him silhouette it, and that was a that was a real shaman. So I could not interrupt that scene. That scene was happening as it was happening. But it was a the ritual took maybe 15 minutes. You know, there was like you know they did, did all kinds of there was smoke and they were, they were spitting on each other. There was all kinds of stuff happening in the scene. Um, so I started with a tripod, and I knew I sort of had shots in my head because I, w I knew roughly they're gonna go to the edge. They're gonna go to the edge of that little mountain. Um, so I set up the wide shot, and then I left the tripod behind, and I ran down there, and I caught the other shots, which are then all handheld. So that was happening during a live scene. I was trying to make a cinematic moment out of a live scene and, and try to structure it, and a lot of it is intuitive and what you like, but uh, there's, it's sort of this, this is maybe an example of more aestheticism where it's not all just happening while it's, while it's happening, but I do believe it happens in, in a time and a relationship that still has truth to what was going on. By the way, you just gave a great example of thinking like an editor while you're shooting. You're thinking sequence. All great verite camera people do that. Uh, we've run out of time, but I w I, I'd like to think that you all understand how privileged you are to have heard this conversation with these incredible DPs. So would you give them a applause? <laughs> <laughs>